Hello and welcome to It's a Vet's Life. Apart from the usual cats and dogs, we'll be meeting some rarer, more exotic animals this week. This is Iggy, this is little LG, and this is little Iggy. And I'll be here at the PDSA in Hull, where 26,500 animals a year are given urgent treatment, funded totally by public donations. And I'll also be visiting this country hotel for pets to find out what makes a good boarding kennel. This morning I had to make a very early start because I got the phone call at 6.30 a.m. The owners had been awakened 10 minutes before with their old dog here screaming the house down. Now, luckily, it wasn't in pain. That screaming was caused by delirium because Paddy here, and he's 17, had had a stroke and that meant he'd suffered a degree of brain damage. And when I saw him, he was rolled over, his eyes were flicking to and fro, a thing called nystagmus, and he couldn't stand up. But with a wee bit of time, you can see that he's... Oh, steady stand. He's still got his balance mechanism awry, but he can actually start to consider what's going on around him. Just try and stand him up a wee minute, Jill, just let's see what he's like. Oh, steady stand. You can probably see that he's got a little bit of a head tilt still, but that's going to wear off. Hey, son, just sit down again for me. That's a good boy. Oh, steady, steady. That's lovely. Now, the main thing is that the owner, Tearful, came in this morning and they thought the dog would have to be put to sleep. In fact, they were certain of it. I knew that in dogs, 24 hours can make the world of difference. In Paddy's case, two hours have made the world of difference. He looks tremendous and I think he's going to be okay. Who knows, he may go on 625. <laughs> You remember wee Henry Mace, the diminutive hamster that we had to operate on its foot? Well, it's back here a few days later just to have its post-operative injection. And if you just look here, you'll see where we froze off the tumour and it's now gone black. There's a wee abscess there, but I knew about that. So what I'm going to do is give him a little injection of antibiotic. You just hold like that, Bernie, because believe me, the muscle in a hamster is tiny as well. We just go in like that and inject the stuff in. That's wonderful. Then we give it a good wee rub because just like us, they would feel a bit of bruising and we need to spread it out. That's wonderful, don't it? Right. So we'll see him again in a week's time and perhaps in four weeks, he'll have all these four paws looking just the same. You know, vets in practice spend an awful lot of time sticking needles into their patients. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, I hate syringes and I hate needles. But honestly, they're a brilliant way of getting material, beneficial material, inside the patient so it doesn't come back out and it can stay in there and do some good. Now to do that, of course, we do use the deadly syringe. This is a big one, tended to be used in farm practice, but incidentally, I saved my own cat's life by giving it 16 injections of fluid using this very syringe. In pet practice, we tend to use this size, this is a two mil syringe, very useful for vaccines, antibiotics, whatever. This, for wee pets, like hamsters and budgies, tiny little needle causes no problem to them at all. Now we inject fluids like I did into my own cat, we inject antibiotics to treat infection, insulin injected if you're a diabetic, and these two wee bottles contain a very important injection. These are vaccine bottles, and I've actually just used these to inject this wee dog here. Now, this is little Jilly. She's a wonderful wee Yorkshire Terrier, and believe me, when I injected her, she said nothing. She didn't make a muff, did Not she? Not a word. No, Not, not a, a word. word. No. Right. Well, that was her second injection, and she's going to come back in uh, four weeks' time and have her final parvovirus injection. They have three normally, one at eight weeks, one at 12 weeks, and I give them one at 16, but your own vet might just have a slightly different routine, but just as effective. Okay, well, that's the surface of the table disinfected. Now, that last wee dog was a tough Yorkshire Terrier, and I know you probably think I'm chickening out and not going to show you me injecting a puppy on screen, but I am. We've got one in here, it's a lap dog. Karen, do you want to bring in your wee puppy? That's not great, eh? <laughs> Can I just have a wee look? Yeah. That's beautiful. This is a King Charles Spaniel, designed really to be a cuddly wee dog, and not a tearaway terrier like a Yorkie, and it's come for its first vaccination. Now, I've given it a check over, and I've just got to get on with the dreaded bit. Do you want to just pop it on there? Because we've disinfected the surface. If you just turn it quickly, and we'll get on with it. Ah, it's brilliant. Okay, little Samantha. Ba-boom. Oh, dear. Oh, oh that's good. 
good, that's good. You felt it a wee bit cold from the fridge, eh? Never mind. It's just a quick yelp and it's worth it. Really worth it. That's wonderful. Isn't that good? Yeah, you're very, very, very clever. Hope that hasn't picked you up, darling. No, no. No, no. We'll give you a wee cut. Maybe I'll show you. <laughs> that's good. Right. Uh, listen, before I forget, what are my tablets? Half a tablet repeated in seven days. Okay, don't okay. forget. Okay. These are all your little booklets that I'll explain to you about insurance and how to look after them. And I need to see you back two weeks' time, which is 12 weeks old, for the same right. injection. Okay. I promise you it won't be as bad. You, you will come, won't <laughs> you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you. darling. Bye. See you then. Bye-bye. It looks pretty much like any other vet's waiting room, with sick animals and anxious owners waiting for the surgery to open. But what's different about the people's dispensary for sick animals is that centres like this one in Hull provide a high standard of care for needy animals whose owners can't afford the cost of the treatment. The PDSA was started 70 years ago and now has 57 centres around the country which provide a service to sick and injured animals irrespective of their owner's ability to pay. While the RSPCA rescues animals who've suffered cruelty, the PDSA gives first-rate treatment to pets with loving owners who simply don't have much cash. We've got three um, full-time vets and one part-time vet. Usually we would have one vet operating all day and the other vets then seeing to people as they come in for consultations. Mrs Smith. We mainly see people who receive social benefits uh, of one kind or another. Um, people like uh, senior citizens, uh, unemployed people, uh, people on income support. This cat broke both legs in a road accident and is being checked over to see how they're mending. It's one of about a hundred cases seen here on a typically hectic day. Oh, well, it seems to be doing quite well. Yeah. It means that we're working in a non-commercial um, atmosphere. The treatment we give to the animals has no bearing whatsoever to the ability of the people to pay for it. So you're free to give the best available treatment to the animal, regardless of what it costs. You get um, more experience of the more serious type of cases. Um, in private practice, we tend to do percentage of vaccinations and spaying and routine work, whereas we tend to get only sick and injured animals. So it's rather intense, and um, but very good experience. Mrs. Dixon has brought her dog back for more eye treatment. The dog isn't the only one feeling relieved. It takes a big worry off your mind. You know, I, can, I know that she's going to get the best treatment and without the worry. I've been bad since before Christmas and I've been at the vet since then and spent a fortune on creams and ointments. Then they said she had to have an operation and as well as worrying about the operation, I was frightened I couldn't afford it. Someone suggested coming here. The last one she had with the anaesthetics and things was between 40 and 60 pounds. We'll just give you these drops and we'll continue with the, the tablets to hopefully help the healing as well. Okay. There you go now. Thank you. Okay. Every two hours. It costs around £150,000 a year to run this centre and 21000 of that is needed just to pay the drug bill. Only a small fraction comes from grateful customers. People donate whatever they can afford. There's no pressure put on them, whatever. And they, we give them an, an envelope to put in whatever they can afford into the box. The average donation in this centre would be 85p, and the average cost of treatment is £5.75. So there's quite a bit to make up, and that's where the appeal side of the organisation come in. Without them, we couldn't, couldn't function. Our main source of income are legacies. Then we get donations. Mm. We also um, have three charity shops in the city. Have about. 60 dedicated voluntary workers have helped me, and they are really marvellous people. The PDSA is constantly trying to improve older centres, replace obsolete equipment, and keep up with the growing demand for its service, 
brought on largely by unemployment. Every small effort to raise money goes straight into caring for sick animals. The more money we get, the, the more we can expand our service. I mean, a lot of our centres need renewing and rebuilding. This is what we want to attain in, in every area, but we haven't got that yet. You come into a very good example of the best unit in the PDSA. The money mainly comes from people who abuse our services, who, who love animals and, and like the work we do. Now, generally it's dogs, cats, budgies, hamsters and other family pets that we get into our surgeries, but just sometimes something like this comes through the door and looks as if it's just landed from Mars. But this is an iguana. It is technically a wild animal being kept in captivity comes from much warmer climates than we've got, but can I just tell you that 100% of reptile diseases are caused by bad management, bad husbandry, or bad nutrition. And you can see why some of them come to me, because they've got problems. If you just take a look at this, this was a broken elbow. It's fixed now, but the animal has got a stiff joint. It's not properly fixed. Now that was really a result of faulty nutrition. We've got to watch, they're not dangerous, but they've got very sharp claws and they can really dig into your hand. And if I just turn around, just use this magnificent tail, longer than the iguana itself, if you hold. Now this is a nabscess of the foot, and you can see how the toe is all badly swollen, just here. And we're treating it now with antibiotic, but we may possibly have to lance that. Okay, Bernard, you just want to pop it off and get it back in its intensive care unit. Mate, it doesn't scratch you now. All right, that's great. Now, they get all types of iguanas. This one here, you'll be able to spot immediately, has something slightly different about it. It technically had anorexia nervosa. Now that simply means anorexia, not eating, nervosa for some nervous reason. And it was just because it was young and frightened. So we gave it a wee hideaway and you know it came around on its own. But if you remember the tail of the other iguana and look at this one, you can see there's quite a difference. Halfway down it suddenly becomes a dead stick. This is because the lady owner quite chuffed by the progress of her little Iggy, dropped the lid of the container onto its tail, severing it. And this is the attempt of the iguana to regrow the tail. In most iguanas, especially the big ones, I don't think the tail would ever regrow. Here, we have this little stick-like attempt. But that's the Iggy, he's doing fine, and he doesn't mind, he's lost a bit of his good looks. Now, if we just take a look at this animal here, this is a different category altogether. This is a green lizard. Now, this wee one's called LG. He's a green lizard, Lacerta viridis, and he's called LG because he's light green. His brother was called DG because he was dark green, but he died, unfortunately. I think he's my favorite because as a lizard, he's a totally different type of animal. And if you look at him closely, you'll see he's watching you all the time with his wee beady eyes. His tail, by the way, is a different structure as well. If he gets caught by a predator or any other, type of animal, then he can reject his tail. He can contract the muscles, fracture the bone without hemorrhage, and he's off, tailless, but off. But he can regrow his tail, unlike some iguanas. He's not here for that reason. He's here because he's got something wrong with him. If you look at this wee leg here, he's got multiple warty growths on this. Now this is called viral papillomata, and we're going to remove it surgically, because we would really prefer him to have a leg like this. Well, as a vet, of course, I've got a broad-based medical knowledge, but on reptiles, I'm no real expert. Fortunately, I've got a friend who is, and we'll be meeting him later. Going away on holiday and leaving your pet can be a stressful experience for both the animal and the owner. But one way of cutting down on that trauma is to really do your homework well before choosing a kennel or cattery. Staff at the Bilton Hilton near Harrogate try to ensure that pets also enjoy themselves whilst their owners are away. But what should anxious owners look for in a good kennels? I think uh, the three main things to be looked for are comfort, cleanliness and security. And you should find that if you're going to look around prospective kennels that the owners should have no qualms about letting you have a good look around and see what the routine is. If your pet's going into kennels, probably um, going to be a bit upset and may try and get away from a strange place like that. And so there should always be double doors into any place where the animal's kept. So Alistair, what are the special requirements from a kennel? 
Well, uh, a panel should always have impervious walls and floors which can be easily washed down and disinfected. And there should be a separate raised area for the animal, animal to sleep on. Um, and also we can see here again the double security of the cage and the outside. What about the size of it? Well, obviously dogs vary in size a great deal, so it's difficult to define a size for the dog, but there should be adequate room for the animal to turn around in. So you quite happy with yes, these? Yes, very ones? happy with this. We can see there's an outside area and an inside area, um, so the dog can choose where it wants to be um, when it's not being out exercised, depending on the weather and its own temperament. So what about in a cattery then? What requirements do they have? Well, the same as kennels. They should have impervious walls and floors, and um, they should do also have a minimum size requirement, which is eight square feet. <coughs> Having inspected the room, what about the menu? While you're lapping up foreign cuisine, what will Fido or Fifi be munching on? Some kennels will just carry on um, feeding the same food to all the dogs, and uh, that can lead to problems with diarrhoea as the dogs change their food. So if possible, you want to go to a kennels where the um, kennel owner will start feeding the food which you normally feed the dog at home. Staff should give animals plenty of regular exercise. Here, the fun happens four times a day. I think it's worth asking when you go to the kennels um, what their routine is for exercise, how many times the dogs go out, and, uh, and, and whereabouts they go, and, and what's done with them, whether they're just left to run around on their own, or whether the, the, the staff are going to play with them. If you find the staff are very happy and, uh, and seem to enjoy the animals, and the animals seem to enjoy being with them, and that's a good indication of the kennels is a nice place to send animals to. It's got to be a holiday for them, as well as for their owners, and they're putting their owners peace of mind. That's what it's all about. They come to know you, and they know we're daft. We've got to be for doing it, but we enjoy it. And I employ staff who do enjoy it. They've got to love their animals, and if you watch a person with animals, you soon know that. When you're having your holiday jabs, it's worth arranging for your pets to have them too. Otherwise, most good kennels won't even grant you a reservation. And most vets now send out yearly reminders anyway for vaccination, but if you are thinking of going on holiday, you should check your pet's booster certificate to make sure it is up to date before you go away. Well, here's the iguana that we saw a few minutes ago, the one with the abscessed foot. He's in his intensive care unit. Actually, it's an old baby incubator, but it's ideal for looking after sick reptiles. We can switch on, put off the alarm, adjust the heating to the level we require, humidity with this, and we've got a nice UVA light at the back, which reptiles love. So that's a good idea for keeping reptiles in prime condition. Now, as I said before, I'm an ordinary vet and not really an expert on reptiles, so I sometimes have to rely heavily upon books to get my information. But if there's one thing better than a book for up-to-date knowledge, it's a real life expert. And I'm lucky there because I've got a friend who's a herpetologist, although I like to call him Roger the Reptile Man. He's here now. Now then, Roger, how are you coping with this one? Looks a bit lively. Yeah, it's a bit difficult. Uh, did you notice the wee lump that's got on the side of his coat? Mm, I've seen it, yeah. Ah, right, well, first job is we're going to have to get it to go to sleep, or we're going to get nothing done. Yeah. So if you can control it long enough to let me get into this leg, that's brilliant. Hold tight because it's going to feel this a wee bit. Tremendous. Wonderful. Just keep it there a minute, Roger. That's great. Now, if you could just pass it gingerly to my gloved nurse, she'll pop it into a case that goes to sleep. Okay, Bernie? Yeah. Watch it doesn't scratch you, bro. Listen, what is this you brought to see? Well, it's one that we don't need gloves for, John. Oh. So, um, I thought, I know that you're actually interested in this group of lizards, so I thought you'd like to have a look at it. It's the actual giant of the family, the green lizard family. Is it likely to bite me? No, not really. That's great. Mm. So this is the same family as little LG? Yes, but it's a giant of the family. So it's a lacerted? A lacerted lizard. Sure yes. enough, Derek. Yeah. That's brilliant. And is it a male or a female? It's a male, John. The large head and the jowls tell you that it's a male. Fantastic. Where does it come from? It's from the Iberian Peninsula. That's Portugal and Spain. And are many of these kept in this country as pets? Not so much now because there's been recent conservation laws, so the importation um, you know, has been restricted. This one has been in the country about eight years, actually. Mm. Mm. Anything wrong with them? Not a thing, not a thing. Kept well, under good condition. That's my interest gone. Mm -hmm. Pop them back in the box, because I've got something that I want you to give me a hand okay. on. Okay. Now then, this should be no surprise to Roger. Bah, it's a fair weight, is this? 
You'll have guessed already what this is, Roger, eh? Snake of some sort. Yeah, you bet. It's a beautiful snake, I think, anyway. Just unravel you, son. Mm. Come on, where is the front end? Here we go. Now, look at that. Isn't that a cracker? Mm. Indian pie, isn't it? Yeah. Indian pie, yeah. The thing is, Roger, could you sort of unpeel it a bit from yeah. this bar? Yeah. That's wonderful. That's right, Kimmy. How long do you think it'll be? Six feet? Five feet? Um, yeah, about six, eh? Right, just pop that bag over there. Now, the thing is, Roger, this looked pretty healthy to me, but you're the expert. What do mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, it looks fine. How can you tell when a snake's healthy and when it's ill? Well, he's got a shine off his skin. He's got plenty of weight on him. It's called poops, by the way, if you feel oh, really? you're more uh, yeah. familiar with them. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not a poisonous snake, is he? No, they're constrictors. Right, mm. So they kill you by crushing you to death? Uh, well, they actually just re restrict breathing. Anyway, the, the man who owns it came to me and he said he thought it had mouth rot. Now, I know that that's mm. quite common in mm. snakes. Can you just manage to hold them like that and let me get a look? Can I get a look under his lip at the side? Yeah, think? yeah. Just like that. It doesn't like this, although it doesn't hurt. Now, all I'm doing is putting the swab in and taking a sample of the saliva. That's great. I'm just taking a wee swab from here to see if there's any pathological bacteria. It looks pretty healthy to me. So, Roger, what do you think about people keeping magnificent animals like this as domestic pets? Well, they are large animals, um, you know, when they're adult, John. They, they can attain 20 foot, these things. So, they're obviously a, you know, a big animal to keep in the home. And at that size, they, they pass large feces, and that can become a problem as well. How about the dangers of keeping them, Roger? Well, there has been a few, you know, isolated incidents where people have been killed. Um, there's one in New York where a chap um, kept one down his cellar and went down to feed it one day and his wife heard all the old furniture moving about. Mm -hmm. When she went down, the snake had killed him and was just about to scoff him. So well, that's certainly quicker than divorce. Yeah, eh? a, a, admittedly, a larger, larger specimen than this. But can, can we get it back in the bag then? We can have a try. Just having a good look at my throat. Just keep it down a bit, Roger. Magic. Okay, here we've got Arthur, deeply sedated. He's not totally unconscious, but then this is like lancing an abscess in us. And I'm just first going to put a needle in to see if it is soft in here and there is a cavity. Right, okay. Now, the pus that's in these things is frequently inspissated and dry. And I'm just going to make a little incision. There'll be a little bit of blood here, but nothing much. Inspissated, by the way, means just dried up so that it's cheesy or semi-hard, unlike liquid buses you sometimes get in human abscesses. And that's good. You just hold steady, Roger. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Just let me have a look like that a wee bit. Could do with being a wee bit deeper than that. There's the some inspissated pus coming out from the core of the abscess. Curetting this out, trying to clean out the muck, because the more I get out, the less the animal will have to get out. That's pretty good now. It's the wee dab. OK, now what I'm going to do is just put this li other little swab, soaked in antiseptic, into the area and just clean out the cavity. I'm using an antiseptic solution. And as you can see, it's not all that worried about this. That's good. That's nice and clean. Lovely. Wonderful. And he's done very well, Arthur. He's done very well, son. Right. So he'll just go back into a controlled temperature environment till he recovers. I don't think that'll worry him much at all, Roger, do you? No, it looks fine. Next week, I'll be reporting from the Studley Royal Country Park in North Yorkshire, where Ernest Kemp gives each of the 600 deer in his herd individual attention. And I'll be back with a selection of patients from a surgery, and we'll be meeting Bernie Winters and his famous showbiz dog, Snorbits. And this wee one that had her injection not so long ago looks as if she's forgiven me. I think she's actually fallen asleep. So we'll see you next week. See the lovely bone structure, magnificent jaws.
And of course, the, the alligator, the tooth fits into a wee socket, so you don't see the big tooth at the side. And that's often a way of differentiating between crocodiles and alligators. This is a oh very unusual croc, isn't it? What's, his, what's that? Well, just look at the shape of the, the, the nose. It's like a spoonbill, isn't it? Aye. That's a crocodile called a gavial, which is a fish-eating croc. And this specially developed jaw is so it can swish through the water and with ease, so there's no resistance to the water, 